sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A holdup man has been hitting large supermarkets in your city. He's fast and he's experienced. Your job? Get him. Tonight, I have a new report for you. A most important one, too. Because when you're asked to try a cigarette, you want to know and you ought to know what that cigarette is meant to people who smoke it all the time. After a full year of observation, a medical specialist who has given a group of Chesterfield smokers thorough examinations every two months for the full year reports no adverse effects to their nose, throat, or sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. More and more men and women all over the country are finding out every day that Chesterfield is best for them. Enjoy your smoking. Try Chesterfields today. They're best for you much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, July 7th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 10.22 a.m. when we got to the corner of 67th Street and Jefferson Boulevard, Lamont Brothers Market. Oh, I guess I should have been scared the way they came in with those guns, but I wasn't. I one came back into the office and said he wanted the money. I gave it to him. I wasn't going to mess with him. Mr. Haskins? Yes, I'm Haskins. Who are you? Police officer, sir. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Friday and Smith. Oh, oh yeah. You're the fellows that was talking about, huh? Sir? Well, the other ones, the cops in the car. They said there'd be a couple of detectives here. Have you seen the other cops yet? Yes, sir. We talked to them. They've already put out a call. I wonder if we get some information from you. Sure. You want to come back here to the office? Yes, sir. Back this way, we can talk there. Let's sit down. Mr. Haskins, if you'd just tell us what happened, please. Well, it's pretty simple. I was sitting here getting the money ready for the bank, and this guy came in, and he said he wanted the money. I had a gun, so I gave it to him. I said, not anymore. He just took the money and left. Mm-hmm. What time was it, sir? Oh, around 8.30, quarter to nine. How many men were there, sir? Well, there was two. Two is all I saw. I... I don't think there was any more of them. All right, sir, if you could just tell us exactly what happened. Well, I told you they came in, they took the money. I know, sir, but if you'd go into more detail... Well, I came in about 7.30 this morning, like always. Checked things over the store to make sure that everything was okay. Then I started checking out the week's receipts. Uh Uh-huh. Well, then, like I said, it must have been 8.45 or so, and heard this knock on the door. I thought there must be something wrong. The employees know not to bother me when I'm making up the deposit slips. Yes, sir. That's when I knew that something was wrong. Right away, I said to myself, Larry, there's something up. Something isn't good. Yes, sir. Well, it was right. Went over to the door and unlocked it. There he was, this big fellow. Stood there with a gun. The way his eyes lit up when he saw all that money laying on the desk. You got any idea of how much money was taken, sir? Well, it was about 6,000 cash. I guess another 1,500 in checks, more or less. Uh-huh. I wonder if you'd give us a description of this man, could you? Well, like I said, he was a... Big one, real mountain of a man, well over six feet, had this gun, you know. Uh-huh. He stood there and said, this is a stick-up. I want that money. And he pointed at the money with his gun. Oh, what kind of a gun was it? Could you tell? That's a great question. Of course I could tell. He had it right under my nose. Shotgun, sawed off. Had the stock cut down, too. Looked like a horse pistol. Well, he handles that thing. I wasn't going to mess with him. Uh-huh. I told him, take the money. Take it and get out. Not to shoot that thing off. He did. Walked right over to the desk and scooped up the money. He had a paper bag. He put it down by the table and he scooped the money into it. Then he said to me to stay put. 
I'll to try to yell or be brave. <laughs> Didn't have to tell me that. I, I wouldn't have tried anything. And he said that there was another man, is that right? Yes, I, I saw him when he left. He's a little fellow. Mm-hmm. About how tall would you say? Well, it's kind of hard to tell. I didn't get very close to him. Well, was he armed too? Yeah, he was carrying a revolver. They drive a car, would you know? Well, if they did, I didn't see it. You went out after them, then? I should say not. With that one fellow waved that gun around, I stayed right here. He said to stay put, and that's just what I did. What'd this big man look like? Oh, a real mountain. He was six two anyway. He must have weighed weighed in at about two fifteen. Mm-hmm. How about his coloring? It was dark. He had black hair. His eyes were dark. Not not a brown. It was almost black. Real real dark. Mm-hmm. And when he spoke, did he have an accent, anything like that that you might have noticed? No. No, I don't think so. At least there was one. I didn't notice it. Mm-mm. Did he have any scars or marks? What? Any scars or marks? Anything that might make it easier for us to identify him? Yes, yes, there was a little scar right right here. Right over the bridge of his nose. Across here. How about his clothes? What was he wearing? Had a brown hat on, a brown jacket. Short kind. Kind of what you'd call that the, the real slick material, you know. Satin, like uh, bowling teams wear. Yes, yeah, sir. Had on a pair of brown pants, brown shoes. How was the other one dressed? I couldn't tell you for sure. Like I said, I only saw him for a minute when I opened the door. He was out there telling the people to just mind their own business. Do that and they wouldn't get hurt. I didn't get a good look at him, but that big one, he was a real mountain. Do you usually have this much money around in the store? No, not usually. See, this was a long weekend. You know, the 4th was Friday, and whenever we have a long weekend, we usually have ten or $12,000 in cash here. That's uh, where the guys really goofed. Sir? Really missed the boat. You know, if they'd known what they were doing, they'd have gotten a lot more. Well, how's that, sir? The safe out in front. Another $7,000 out there. Guys missed it completely. Yes, sir. Yeah, I sure hope they, they don't come back for it. a.m., Frank and I checked with the officers in the radio unit that had answered the call. They'd gotten out a broadcast on the bandits and then started a canvas of the neighborhood, but they didn't find anyone who could give them any information. One of the clerks was able to describe the smaller of the two suspects, and we got out a local and an APB on them, Then we took the market manager downtown to look at the mug books. He told us that the larger man had worn gloves all the time he was in the store, so there was no need to look for fingerprints. The market bandits had been operating for the past eight months. In that time, they'd held up 17 stores. Their method of operation was always the same. They'd hit only after a weekend or on the Monday following a holiday weekend. They'd hit only the larger supermarkets of the ranch type. Their operations had taken them all over the Southland. We'd tried to stake the markets that might be hit, but their field of operations had been so wide that it was impossible. 2.15 p.m., the market manager, Larry Haskins, started on the sixth mug book. Sure, a lot of them. Yes, sir. All these fellas all committed some crime, huh? Yes, sir, that's right. That one there looks like my brother-in-law. He's got a weak chin. Uh-huh, yeah, just like him. No? Mm-mm. Go through a few of these, and they all begin to look alike. Did you ever notice that? Yes, sir. Hey, wait a minute. Yes, sir? This fella here. This one right here, you see? Mm-hmm. That's the fellow, there's no doubt about it. That's the one. The market manager had identified Bernard R. Hansen as one of the holdup men. The other employees of the store were called in and they identified the same picture as being the man who'd held them up. We checked on his record and found that he'd been convicted for armed robbery and had been sentenced to the state penitentiary. He'd also served six and a half years and had been released. We got the last known address of the suspect. Frank and I checked it out and found that Hanson had moved some months before, but had left a phone number where he might be contacted. 6.30 p.m. Frank put in the call. Yes, sir. That's right, sir. You sure about that, are you? I see. Well, if there's anything more you can think of, I'd appreciate a call. That's right, Michigan 5211. Extension 2511. Smith, that's right. Or if I'm not in, ask for Joe Friday. No, sir. Friday, like the day in the week. That's right. All right. Thank you very much, doctor. Goodbye. Anything? Yeah, I talked to Dr. Corby. The place is a rest home. Hanson's there as a patient. Been there for the past four months. Mm -hmm. Doctor says he's bedridden. We 
checked on the rest home. It was a private sanitarium in the valley. We got in touch with the medical authorities and found that the head of the hospital was listed as Dr. James Corby. Frank and I drove out and talked to Dr. Corby and the rest of the staff. From them, we got the story that Hanson had been a resident of the home for the past four months. We found that he had a lung ailment and was confined to his bed 24 hours a day. The doctor showed us his records and charts, and from what we could tell, it would have been impossible for Hanson to have been the bandit. Three weeks passed. On August 4th, the market thieves hit again, this time out in East Los Angeles. They got away with a little over $9,000. The manager of the market came downtown and checked the mug books. They again identified Hanson as the thief. We had the stats office make another run on the M.O. used. The result came back, and out of the thousands of cards checked, only one fitted the way the robbery had been carried out, Hanson's. We called the rest home and found that on the day of the holdup, the suspect hadn't left his bed. Another month passed. During that time, we ran down all leads. Informants were questioned, but they could tell us nothing. Apparently, the holdup men were hitting and then dropping completely out of sight until they hit again. Monday, October 27th, 8.05 a.m. I checked in for work. Joe? Yeah. Did you just get in? Yeah, a couple of minutes ago. Sure is a beautiful day, isn't it? Yeah. Did you see Diddy in yet? No. The way he talked yesterday, I don't want to. Well, he's pretty hacked. I can't blame him too much. The guy sure seemed to have it stopped. The thing I can't understand is that everybody's positive it's Hanson. Doesn't seem to be any doubt in their minds. That doesn't make any sense. Did you get the kickback on the doctor? Yeah, I came in late yesterday. How about it? I well, can't find anything on him. Family man, lives out in the valley, a couple of blocks from the hospital. Checked his bank account, he does pretty well, not great. No big deposits lately. Mm-hmm. Did you check the AMA on him? Yeah, he's not a member. They haven't got anything on him. How about the rest of the staff out there? Well, seems to be okay. Two of the nurses have been there for over two years, and the male nurse was hired about five months ago. That'd be just before Hanson got there. Yeah. Well, what's his record? There isn't any. Not a thing on him in the files, nothing from Washington. Well, I don't know. They seem to come up out of the ground, pull the jobs, and then drop back in. Nothing on the partner? No, I thought I had something. Talked to an informant this morning while I had coffee. He thought at first that he knew who the little guy was, but... And he remembered that the fellow he was thinking about died two years ago. A hot shot, I'll get it. Well, let's go. I hit again. At 8.01 a.m. that morning, a pair of hold-up men had walked into a market out on Adams Boulevard and robbed the place of a little under $11,000. The manager gave us a description of the hold-up men. One was large, dark, and had a small scar over the bridge of his nose. The other was small, sandy-haired, and had no visible marks or scars. We showed the manager mug shots of Hanson, and he positively identified him as the larger of the two men. A local and an APB was gotten out on the pair, and then Frank and I drove out to the hospital to see Hanson. 8.46 a.m. We talked with Dr. Corby. I know you men are trying to do your duty, but I've told you before, it couldn't possibly be Mr. Hanson. I know for a fact that he hasn't been out of his bed this morning. Was it possible for him to get out of his room without you knowing it? No. I wonder if we could see him, Doctor. No, I don't think that'd be possible. He's still asleep and I can't have him disturbed. Now, you're sure, though, that he couldn't have left the hospital without you knowing it? Absolutely. No chance of it. What time does Hanson generally wake up, Doctor? Depends. Usually, though, I'd say he's awake by 9.30 or so. I wonder if we could wait and talk to him. If you like. I'll tell one of the nurses to call you when he's awake. All right, sir. That'd be fine. One thing, though, I must insist on. What's that, Doctor? He mustn't be excited. I don't think you gentlemen really know how ill Mr. Hanson is. If you had any idea, you wouldn't be out here with this ridiculous questioning. Yes, sir, we understand. We're just trying to get this thing straightened out as soon as we can. Fine. I'll go along with you part of the way, but I'll not have my patient disturbed. Any excitement would be very bad for him. Well, don't worry, doctor. We'll be as brief as possible. Fine. If you'll excuse me now, I've got some things to do. I'll tell the nurse to call you when he wakes up. And remember, no excitement. What do you figure, Joe? It's got me. The way he talks, every one of those witnesses are wrong. Yeah, but it's happened before. Get a positive identification and end up with the wrong guy. Yeah, but all of them are so positive, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You the police officer? Yeah, that's right. Why? I'm Bob Jameson. I work here. Oh, yeah, you're the male nurse, that right? Yeah. You're out here about Barney Hanson, aren't you? We want to see him, yeah. What can we do for you? It's about Barney. What about him? I don't think things are the way they look. What do you mean by that? I wouldn't want the doctor to know I've been talking to you. He'd raise the roof, probably fire me. Well, what's it about, Jameson? Like I said, it's about Barney. Yeah? Well, when I came here, they told me that Barney was pretty sick. Said they didn't expect him to live. Yeah. One day the buzzer rang in his room. You know, he wanted something? Uh-huh. Well, the doctor was on the phone. The other nurses were busy. So I started down the hall to see what Barney wanted. Got to the door of the room, and the doctor stopped me. Uh-huh. Really read me off. Said that I wasn't to go into the room at all. That he was taking care of Barney personally. That he'd see what he wanted. Yeah. No, that was just the first time. 
Same thing's happened a couple more times. And he told us about you. Told us what to say if you asked any questions. Well, what did he tell you? Said that we wasn't to tell you anything. That we didn't know anything. Well, why didn't you tell us all this before? Well, you see, this isn't a regular hospital. I don't think that he's even a regular doctor. I worked around hospitals for a long time, and I never saw no doctor act like he does. He doesn't even know how to write out a diet, feed some of the people here all the wrong things. That right? Yeah, and I'll tell you something else, too. What's that? I don't think there's anything wrong with Barney. I think the whole reason for him being here is phony. Bob? Oh, yes, doctor. What are you doing here? Came to see if these gentlemen needed anything. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll take care of it now. Will you check on Mr. Hardy, please? See if he's awake yet. Yeah, sure. Just a minute. What? I'd like you to stay here for a minute. I'm afraid we're going to have to see Mr. Hanson right now, Doctor. I'm afraid that's impossible. I told you before, I'm not going to have him disturbed. I'm afraid we're going to have to disturb him. Won't take very long. Jameson, where's his room? I'll show you. It's down this way. I'm going to speak to your superiors about this, coming into a hospital and disturbing patients. I'm sure the fact that your officers doesn't give you the right to do this. Now, this is his room. You want to open the door? Well, how about it, Doctor? Well, I don't understand it. He's got to be here. He can't get out of bed. I'm sure there's some explanation for his disappearance. Yeah, maybe you can explain this, too. There's stuff here in his bed. What is it, John? A gun and some money. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. The first cigarette to give you premium quality either way you like them. This means that king size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. Chesterfield is first to name all its ingredients, ingredients that make the best possible smoke. And Chesterfield gives you this full year scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. So enjoy your smoking. Change to Chesterfield today. Much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. a.m. We called the office and two more teams of men came out to help us search the place. Hanson was not on the grounds of the hospital. In his room, we found several floor plan drawings of markets that had been robbed. The drawings showed the location of the manager's office and of the safe. Along with the drawings, we found several maps with roads marked on them leading back to the hospital. A stakeout was placed on the rest home in the event that the suspect returned and Frank and I drove the doctor back downtown. We talked to him for an hour before he finally told us the story. He said that Hanson had come to him and offered him money to say that he was ill and to give him a room. The doctor went on to say that after he got started, he tried to get out of the deal, but that Hanson said he'd get his family if the doctor said anything about his activities to the police. Dr. Corby gave us the name of Hanson's accomplice, Marty Peterson. He said that he didn't know where Peterson lived, but that he usually came out a couple of times a week to see Hanson. We notified the stakeout to be on the lookout for Peterson, and then we booked Dr. Corby at the main jail. We ran the name Marty Peterson through R&I, but we got no make. We sent the name to George Brereton up at CII in Sacramento and also to Washington. The kickback gave Peterson a record of two arrests of robbery and one for ADW in the East. It also gave the name of a sister who lived in Los Angeles. We checked with her, and she was able to tell us where Peterson lived. Thursday, October 30th, Frank and I drove out to his apartment. Who is it? It's the manager. Yeah, what is it? You Marty Peterson? Yeah, what do you want? Police officers, you're under arrest. Hey, oh, come on, drop on up. Come get out of here, you lousy fuck. All right, come on, get up. You got no right to come in here and bother me. What's all this about? Want to shake him? Yeah, come on, get your hands up on that wall. And he's carrying a gun, Joe, here. I got it. What are you guys trying to prove? I didn't do nothing. You guys lean on everybody like this. Fellow's got a record, and right away he's fair game for every crummy cop in the country. Yeah, you bet. Come on, let's go. Well, you still haven't told me what this is all about. What are you putting the pinch on me for? Robbery. Robbery? You're off your rocker. I'm out here on a vacation. I haven't done anything. You're an ex-con with a gun. That's a felony. And where's Barney Hanson? Who? Barney Hanson. Where is he? 
I don't know no Barney Hanson. Don't know what you're talking about. Now, let's come off it, Peterson. Now, where is he? Barney Hanson? And I might know who you're talking about. I know a fellow by that name, but he's out in the hospital in the valley. I haven't seen him for a long time in a hospital out in the valley. Nice try, Peterson. Hanson checked out of the hospital. We got the doctor. He told us all about it. Now, where's Hanson? I don't know. Last I heard of him, he's out at that hospital. If he ain't there now, I don't know where he is. All right, let's go downtown. That doctor copped out, huh? Yeah. Filled us in on the whole setup. How about the money? Hmm? You find the money? No, we didn't find anything. You didn't find any dough at all? Not a bit. The crumb, the lousy crumb. He told me to be safe out there. They'd never shake a hospital. Not a dime, huh? No. Looks like he left you to stand for this. He probably took off with all the money. Probably never see him again. Yeah, we well, ain't gonna get away with it. No, sir, he ain't. Looks like he will. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you where he is. We took Marty Hansen down to the city hall, and he was booked at the main jail. Before he was booked, he gave us the name and address of Hansen's girlfriend. Frank and I drove over and talked to her. She told us that she hadn't seen the suspect for several weeks. She said that she'd heard that Hanson had been running around with another girl. She also told us that she'd heard Hanson had bought a new car and was running around with a new bunch of friends. She said that she hadn't seen him since he got the new car, but that she'd heard it was a new Oldsmobile and it was painted a fire engine red. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout in her apartment, and then we began to check out the Oldsmobile dealers in the Los Angeles area. Two teams of men were assigned to help us in running down the list. It took us two days to talk to the dealers in town. Each of the dealers was shown a mugshot of Hanson. Two days went by. Finally, we got an identification. A dealer out on Franklin in Hollywood reported that he'd sold a car to Hanson. However, when we checked the address he gave us, we found that Hanson had moved a week before and left no forwarding address. We got in touch with the Department of Motor Vehicles, and from them, we got the address where they'd sent the pink slip. It was an apartment house out on Highland Avenue. Frank and I went out to check it out. Yes? Bernard Hansen in? No, he isn't. Something you wanted? You're expecting him? I don't know. I haven't seen him this morning. I just got here myself. What if we could talk to you? Who are you? Police officers. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? I'm Lily Edwards. Come on in. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Get you anything? A cup of coffee? Anything? No, no thanks. When'd you last see Hansen? Last night. We got a date at 2.30 this afternoon. What time is it now? Well, it's 2.37, ma'am. Late. He'll be along in a minute. What do you want to see him about? Done something? Better if we could talk to him. Personal, huh? Yes, ma'am. He's a wild one, old Barney. Him and that red car. Real wild. Ma'am? That car he drives. You know, it's a red Olds. He's like a kid with it. Always wiping it off, taking care of it. I think he'd bring it up here at night if he could. Never seen anything like it. Mm-hmm. How long have you known Hanson, Miss Edwards? Not long. A couple of weeks, I guess. Not much more than that. Where'd you meet him? Well, I hope you won't get the wrong idea, but... Ma'am? Well, I live down on Vine Street, below Fountain, you know? Yeah. Well, I usually have morning coffee at the drugstore, the big one on Vine. Well, one morning Barney comes in. I guess it's about nine, somewhere around there. He plunks down on a stool next to mine. Then he takes out a package of cigarettes and starts to light one. He's shaking so much he can hardly hold the match up to the cigarette. Well, I got to laughing because I thought he was hung over. Anyways, we got to talking, and the next thing I knew, he asked me out to lunch. Uh-huh. Well, I know it wasn't proper, but I figured, well, he seemed like a nice guy, so I told him that I'd meet him. We had lunch that day, and we started been going together since. I see. Hanson ever told you what he did for a living? No. I asked him a couple of times, but he wouldn't say anything right to the point. He, you know, kind of hedged around the bush. So I figured that he didn't want to tell me, and I stopped asking. He was always nice to me. No need for me to pry into his personal affairs. What time you got now? It's 2.40, ma'am. Can't understand it. He's usually so prompt. I hope nothing happened to him. He said sure to meet him at 2.30. Or was it 3.30? I don't remember too well. Never sure about times or dates, things like that, you know. Yes, ma'am. You ever met a man named Peterson, Marty Peterson? Marty Peterson? Yeah, I've met him, little guy. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he's a friend of Barney's. They're in some sort of business together. I don't know just what it is, but I know that they're associated in some way. Hanson's never said anything about this business to you, has he? No. Like I said, he's very close mouthed about what he does. You ever mention a Dr. Corby to you? Corby. No, I don't think I've ever heard that name before. Would you know how long Hanson's lived here? No, I think he moved in just before I met him. I don't think he's been here very long. Say, what are all these questions about? I hope I haven't said anything to get Barney in trouble. He's such a nice guy. I sure wouldn't want to do that. No, ma'am, you haven't done that. Hi, Lily. Who are you? What are you doing here? Police officers. You're under arrest, Hanson. For what? Suspicion of robbery. I'll shake him, Joe. 
Now, wait a minute. What is this, a shakedown? What are you guys trying to prove? You got nothing on me. I fell once, I did my time, I owe you nothing. He's clean, Joe. Why'd you do that? I'm not giving you any trouble. I got no reason. You got nothing on me. I got nothing to worry about. I'll go with you. There's no reason not to. You mean what these guys say is true? You've been mixed up in some robberies? Oh, knock it off. What do you mean, knock it off? Don't you talk to me like that. I'm not going to take talk like that from you. Like I said, knock it off. All right, come on. Let's go. You really figure you got me for a 211, huh? Yeah, we got the rest of them, too. Peterson and the doc? That's right. I suppose they talked, huh? Yeah, they told us all about it. Sweet racket. Should have known it could only last so long. Should have figured that the longer I played against the house, the shorter my chances were. It is true, and you never told me. All this time, and you never told me you were a crook. Of all the rotten deals... Oh, shut up, will you? Always shooting off your big mouth. Listen, Barney Hanson, I told you before, don't you talk to me like that. I won't take it. You haven't got much choice now, have you, Lily? You know something, cop? What's that? Might be kind of pleasure to get into a nice, quiet jail. Get away from this dumb broad. She's the dumbest broad in the entire United States and Canada. Real pretty, but boy, she's stupid. Now, I told you, Barney Hanson, I'm not going to have you talk to me like that. Kid's a real shrew. Young, and she's a real shrew. Let's go. Glad to get away from you. All right, Barney Hanson, that does it. I'm through with you. I've had it. It's going to be a long time before I even talk to you. A long time. Yeah, well, you're right about that. Let's go. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 4th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Earlier tonight, George Fenneman gave you what I consider pretty strong evidence that Chesterfield is the cigarette you ought to be smoking. That's why I'd like you to try a pack of Chesterfields. I think you'll find they give you everything you want. A real good taste and Chesterfield mildness. Bernard R. Hansen and Martin S. Peterson were tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree. They were filed on for ten counts and received sentences as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of from five years to life. Dr. James Corby was allowed to plead guilty to a lesser charge and was sentenced to one year in the county jail and placed on probation for ten years. One of the terms of his probation being that he is not permitted to operate a rest home. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Herb Ellis. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, in the fight against an old enemy, polio... Medical research has armed us with a powerful new weapon, gamma globulin. Used soon enough, it can prevent the paralyzing effects of polio. But first, you must furnish the raw material, blood. Doctors urgently need your donation of blood to make gamma globulin. So call the Red Cross. Please don't put it off. It's too important. Call the Red Cross tomorrow and make an appointment to give blood. 